Well, trying to speak words of encouragement about the faith, and uh, we're looking at uh, centering in on the text in Hebrews 11 about what faith is, the, def the definitions that are provided there are the thing that we're currently concerned with, and we'll keep going there. I think these are useful things. I hope that they are. Um, today, we're looking at the first half of that first verse. But the first and second verses in their entirety here, which is the real kernel is uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen by faith the people of old received their commendation so if we want a commendation from God it will be gotten by faith but for today's lesson we're looking at the fact that faith is the assurance of things hoped for so we want to focus in on this and get to the meaning of it. And I think we can do that by looking at some passages in the New Testament where the same uh, word is used, this idea of assurance. And it becomes very clear what is meant, I think, by its use here and how it relates directly to faith. So that's where we're going this morning and what we're planning to do. And that will start in a moment in 2 Corinthians 9, if you want to be turning there. But first, I will give you something of the, the dictionary on this. It is a word in the original language that is uh, generally taken in a literal way that uh, Assurance is, you know, making something sure, <laughs> as in making something steady, perhaps, like uh, standing underneath or supporting something. A, uh, a pedestal, a tripod, a stool would be considered an assurance. <laughs> um, a thing uh, that is an assurance could be a foundation or a substructure, you know, something that is underneath and is supporting. And, um, you know, Greek is a, is a very literal language that is uh, to say they, they use very concrete terminology to express uh, very metaphorical things. And this, I think, is one of them because what we mean by this is that it is the basis for a claim, the basis for belief. You know, we... There is a reason for which we believe, or there is a thing that is the the thing that is that we that is held to, or that is claimed. That the reality of that thing, the genuineness of that thing, is what supports the claim being made. So the assurance is a reasonable reading. But that's the idea uh, behind this thing. It's literally under and standing, <laughs> um, which we would probably say basis or support. But 2 Corinthians 9, is verses 1 through 5, is the first pa passage we'll look at together where this concept appears. And I think it's very useful for showing what is meant by this, I guess, uh, heady esoteric concept of support um, I think it can get pretty real here in 2 Corinthians 9 it's the first five verses where Paul writes to the church in his second letter it's superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints for I know your readiness of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia saying Achaia has been ready since last year and your zeal your zeal has stirred up most of them but I'm sending the brothers so that your, our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you aren't ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. 
So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift that you have promised. I'll stop right there. Well, it seems pretty clear what's happening. The apostle uh, writes to Corinth, which is part of the, you know, it's part of Greece. Achaia is just Greece. Um, sending word to them that, uh, you know, he's telling other churches about Corinth, saying, well, Corinth has already set aside funds for the relief of the saints in Judea. They, they've had that done, you know, since last year they've been doing that. Well, it was 1 Corinthians 16 where he said that, you know, every week they ought to be saving up. That involves those who give. You know, you look back over the week, and if you have prospered that week, then the Lord should prosper that Lord's day. But the other part of that, of course, is that the church is taking a portion of that that they're using, storing up to send to Judea for the relief of the saints there kind of argues for about a year between the two letters, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, but that's beside the point. What he's doing is saying, hey, Corinth, you know, I've told the other churches that you have been ready. You've been setting aside funds for a year already, which is, you know, interesting. But what if they aren't ready? You know, that's what he's getting at. I boasted to you about you to Macedonia. Now, if Macedonians come with me after I boasted to them about you being ready, and we get there and you're not ready, well, that would be humiliating. But that's what would happen. That would be humiliating. And this is where the meaning comes. Why is that humiliating? Well, it's a little humiliating to Corinth in that they had instructions to get ready. They said they were getting ready, and they weren't. But why is that humiliating to Paul? As he said, we'd be humiliated, not to speak of you. Why would Paul be humiliated by that? Well, he said it'd be humiliating for us for being so confident. At verse uh, 4. For being so confident. Paul would be humiliated for claiming an assurance that was not, in fact, reality. Where uh, my translation says, for being so confident. We'd be humiliated, not to mention you, for being so confident. Well, literally, it says, uh, we'd be humiliated, not to mention you, in this, my assurance of the boasting that I made to Macedonia in verse 2. And of the boasting in verse 3, that should not prove empty. So he's saying my assurance of our boasting, i.e., I've boasted to Macedonia that you are ready, the I'm giving that assurance. Well, the assurance of that is that it's real at Corinth, that they are, in fact, setting aside the money. They have, in fact, been doing this for a year, and they are ready, whenever the apostle comes, to send their gift down to Judea, not knowing exactly when the apostle will show up. But his saying this to the other congregations is his giving an assurance. That's our key word right there. His confidence that this thing over in Corinth, where he is not currently, and there's not, this is pre-Zoom, no Zoom, no, no, uh, not even in Skype, you know, uh, He's not there. He has no way of seeing or knowing what's happening over there in Corinth. But he sent this letter. He's got reports that they repented of the wrongdoing that is detailed in 1 Corinthians. And therefore, he believes that they are accomplishing what he 
said to them to accomplish in 1 Corinthians 16. So he gives that assurance to the other congregations. But the, the assurance is it being fact, it being reality. Which is why he said at verse 5, <clears throat> It says 2 Corinthians 9, verse 5. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised. <laughs> so he thought about this and said, Yeah, soon I'll be heading over there with brethren from Macedonia to whom I have boasted that you've been ready for a year. I would sure hate to show up and find that you haven't been doing this, actually. So that's why I sent some brothers ahead to make sure and remind you that you agreed to do this and we're coming. And I like the sign that says, in God we trust, all others pay cash. You know, <laughs> that's, that's basically what this is about. In God we trust, all others pay cash, i.e., Paul is, does not put his faith in men. Although he, you know, reckons that they are listening from the faithful reports he has received of their repentance, and he reckons that they have decided to um, abide by the commandment to give of their means in 1 Corinthians 16. In point of fact, he doesn't know that. He's sending some guys on ahead to make sure that that is going to be the case. That means he does not put his faith in men. Whereas he does and we must put our faith in God where Paul sends people ahead of time over to Corinth to make sure they're really doing what they said they were going to do, we don't do that to God. We don't send somebody up to heaven to find out whether God's telling us the truth or whether God's holding up his end of the bargain. That's not faith. Faith is being sure that God is doing what he said he would do. That's what he means by this. Or, I'm sorry, that's what we mean by this. You can see that there's a big difference there between, you know, I, I believe that they're doing this. I, I'll give you my assurance that this is so, but you recognize there's a limit to what you can actually assure in the flesh. Right? That's different from, I believe in God, and there is assurance that he is real, and he rewards those who seek him. That's what this is about. Now, the next place we go is Hebrews 1. So that's, uh, you know, the 2 Corinthians 9, you know, for, for definition purposes. But I think it's useful because you can see a big difference there, and you can see what the substance of that is. There's a thing that we say is so remote, you know, not being there, a thing unseen. And in the case of mere men, Paul felt it necessary to make sure by sending somebody ahead of time. That's very different from what we do with God. But you get the idea. The relationship there is clear, I think. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 is the next place. I don't think we'll spend nearly as much time here. But the revelation from God to mankind is better now than it was in ages past because Christ is better than the patriarchs. It says in Hebrews chapter 1 in the first three verses, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, 
through whom also he created the world, who also is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, who also upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So God in various ways, you know, and at various times and various ways spoke to the fathers through messengers, but in these last days has spoken to us by his son. So if you think about this, what, what he's getting at is there may be in times past, in, in ancient days, uh, in, in you know, other countries even besides Israel, there was a dim or even an incomplete view of God and of his will for us. But in Christ, the Son of God is the exact imprint of his nature. He is the very nature of God. And that nature, in, uh, you know, that, that word there, nature, that, uh, as mine is translated, the exact imprint of his nature. Uh, there at Hebrews 1 verse 3 is our key word for assurance, the support, the, you know, the underpinning, the, the, the foundation, the basis. That this Son of God who came to earth and took on flesh as you and I have flesh is nonetheless God and is God in the flesh. He's an exact representation of the substance of God or the assurance of God, the basis that God exists. And I've likened it to the Gospel of John, just that first chapter, 18th verse right there, um, where he says, no one has ever seen God the only God who is at the Father's side has made him known to us or explained him to us. None of us have ever seen God. It is the God who came from the bosom of the Father, from the side of the Father. Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came in the flesh, that is the one who has explained the nature of God, what God looks like, if you will according to John's gospel. And that's, that's correct. Of course, that, that's clearly what uh, Hebrews 1 is referring to. He created the world through him. That's very consistent with John 1. The radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's a very clear parallel to the first chapter of John. So this is telling us that Jesus is the basis for believing in God. We know something, actually we know more. We know everything that we know about God through him, in part because he is the word. But this is to say he is better than what came before in terms of the revelation, the word that came through them. He's the fullness, the completeness, the, the essence. And in chapter 3 of Hebrews, we're still drawing a comparison between Christ and what follows, or I'm sorry, between the, uh, uh, the patriarchs and Moses and what follows in Christ. And Christ is more sure even than Moses was, though Moses was faithful. 
in just the same way that Christ is is a better revelation, a better explanation of God's nature than whatever came before, so also Christ is a better prophet than the prophets that came before, including Moses. That's what this is about in Hebrews 3. And it's verse 5 down to 14, if you'll uh, look there with me. Moses was, faith was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart, they have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we've come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So the same way, you know, that Christ was better than the revelation that came before, Christ is better than the prophets that came before, including Moses. And in fact, if you look at this idea of today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion in the wilderness. They were responsible. They, they were held responsible. They had to keep following Moses. And when they didn't, there were consequences. In the same way, we must hold fast to the head that is Christ. Now again, he closes this idea saying at the uh, 13th verse, exhort one another every day as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You know, it's today again. <laughs> it keeps happening. Every day that I, that I get to is today. And we exhort one another while it is today so that we won't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. As they were hardened in, and they fell in the wilderness. You know, it stands as a warning for us. But he's saying... In that 14th verse, we've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm all the way to the end. They who fell in the wilderness did not hold their original confidence firm all the way to the end. If they had, they would have entered the promised land, but they wouldn't take it. They allowed the spies to discourage them from going into the promised land. And they died in that wilderness because of that. But did you notice that the 14th verse is parallel to the 6th verse? Hebrews 3 verse 6 said... We are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Well, this word confidence is the same word as Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance, the assurance, the basis, the support We are his house if we hold fast our assurance, our basis for believing. That's what he's getting at. He said it's uh, at verse 6, he called this confidence and he called it... Um, 
Sorry, I need larger print <laughs> or longer arms, maybe. Uh, yes, we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in hope. It's both that assurance, our key word in the study today, and also our boasting in hope. And I hope you remember a few minutes ago, we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 talking about Paul boasting about Corinth. These are related things. It's one thing to boast about the faith of people that we know in God. It's another thing to boast about the promises God has made to us. One of those is firmer than the other. One of those is surer than the other. Right? One of those is faith, real faith. And the difference between the formulation in verse 6 and the formulation of verse 14, if we hold fast, firm to the end. Actually, verse 6 also says firm to the end. I don't know why that's not in my translation. The only difference is in verse 6, what we're holding fast to is our confidence and our boasting in hope. In verse 14, what we're holding fast to is our original confidence. That tells me that that boasting in hope is, you know, bundled up, if you will, tantamount, you know, package deal with the confidence, the assurance. What, that's what it's telling me. And this, this also is putting a nice you know, set of bookends on this thought in Hebrews 3. Makes it clear that these are related things. And the reason he talks about Moses was faithful, and you know, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Well, that's David speaking centuries later. And yet it was an application a binding of what happened in the day of Moses. And yet Jesus, as a son, is greater than Moses. Therefore, he is more binding. And we must hold that original confidence firm to the end. And we encourage one another to this. So I think in retrospect... It's nice to think again about Hebrews 11, verse 1. You know, knowing the things that we've seen. We saw that at 2 Corinthians 9 that Paul had a certain amount of trust, but he needed to verify. Uh, we saw in Hebrews 1 that Christ is better than all the revelation that came before. He makes known a much clearer picture, in fact, the very nature of God. That's assurance. And we just finished here in Hebrews 3. How the, the assurance that we have, the trust that we placed into God, the belief that what God said is true and is real and is going to happen is the thing we have to hold on to to get through life and to finish this course. That's why Hebrews 11.1 1 says faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It means faith is when we are assured, when we are certain about the thing that we hope for. We're convicted about that. There's a basis in reality for that. It's not that we, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, you know, when I die, I mean, I sure hope there's something else after this. Like, no, <laughs> there is. There absolutely is something here. I know that there is. I don't see it yet, because you can't see it with fleshly eyes. But it's there. It's real. We're certain about that. There's a reason to believe God. There's a reason to live right now for the hope of heaven then. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Being sure about this, we know it is real. There's substance to it. It is, you know, it is the thing that's real. People think spiritual sometimes means um, ethereal, uh, somehow, you know, metaphorical. 
uh, ill-defined, not clear, maybe not even real, fanciful fairy tale. That is the opposite, the opposite. This world is the temporary. This world is the Johnny-come-lately. This world is, is going to be burned up and everything in it. The spiritual world existed before this, and it will exist after this. We have a reason to believe in God. We have a reason to live right. And trusting in God in this way, knowing that he is there, knowing that he rewards those who seek him, that, that is faith. That's the first part of this. So, all right. That's the end of that. Are we perhaps speaking today and you are not yet a child of God? You are not a Christian. Do you believe in Jesus Christ that he is the Son of God? Do you believe the things that we've been reading about here that God has put many things into motion to help us, to encourage us to stay the course and to go along in life? to trust in him even when things are bad, especially when things are bad. <laughs> if you believe in Jesus, that he is the son of God, repent, change your heart to serve him from now on and confess him with the mouth as the son of God and be buried together with him in baptism. Put to death the old person of sin so that you might be raised together with him in baptism resurrected from the dead, a new creature created in him for good works. We have made arrangements for water for any that need to do this. But if today you are a Christian, you've already been baptized in his name in water for forgiveness of sins, but in some way have not lived right, let us pray for you based on your repentance too and your resolve to do right. If you need the prayers of the saints today, or if you need to be baptized, let that need be known now, please, by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>